Good evening, everybody. My name is Patrick Fisher. I'm the executive director of Erie Arts and Culture. I thank you for joining us this evening as uh, part of the next installment of our Pro Network series. Uh, Erie Arts and Culture, one of our strategic priorities that came out of our 2019 strategic plan was to really focus on building the capacity of the individuals and organizations that represent uh, our creative and cultural sector in Northwestern Pennsylvania. And our Pro Network series, which is partially underwritten through a Artworks grant from the National Endowment for the Arts, is one of the ways by which we do that. Uh, we believe that artists and uh, creative professionals can make a very large positive impact in shaping our community when they are provided with access to professional development resources and opportunities. And one way that we do that is through knowledge sharing uh, and cross-pollination through things like tonight's webinar. Um, so I want to thank the National Endowments for the Arts for their support. And I encourage you all to visit the Pro Network webpage within the Erie Arts and Culture website, which you can find under our capacity building tab. There you will find uh, previously recorded webinars such as this one, as well as uh, opportunities for artists that are internal to Erie Arts and Culture, such as our fellowship program, our teaching artists program, uh, and our grant program, as well as opportunities that are external to us. Uh, every Monday, Jade Mitchell, our creative director, scours the internet looking for paid opportunities for artists uh, that uh, folks in our community are eligible to apply for, from residencies to fellowships to uh, public art projects, et cetera. Uh, so we work to update that every Monday and, and encourage you to, to make a habit of bookmarking that and checking that. This evening, we are joined by Ulysses Owens Jr., uh, who I had the pleasure of getting to know during my time in Jacksonville at the Cultural Council of Greater Jacksonville. Ulysses Owens Jr. is a drummer, creative entrepreneur, performer, author, and educator. Ulysses goes the limit in the jazz world and beyond. His passion for career development and creative entrepreneurship has taken him around the world as a lecturer, helping students identify their purpose and how to navigate this ever-changing terrain entrepreneurially as a creative. Ulysses this evening will present an overview of the concepts included in his newly published book, The Musician's Career Guide, Turning Your Talent into Sustained Success, which is presently the number one new release on Amazon. This book, uh, in addition to being something that is available to consumers, will serve as a textbook for various music businesses and career development programs around the world. Ulysses, thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you for having me, Patrick. I'm so excited, man. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. I have a whole presentation for everybody. Um, and then I will get it going. So uh, here we go. All right. All right, so uh, hello everyone, hope you're well. Um, I, I would imagine Patrick, you're gonna manage those that are coming in, right? Yes. Oh, Jade, okay, great. Um, so anyway, I wanna say hello everyone. I'm so happy to, to see you all. Uh, for those that are on the call, for those that will be joining uh, this via the video, I'm very thankful to, to have you all involved and, and, and to speak to you. Uh, I've been to Pennsylvania quite a few times, you know, via uh, Philadelphia and, and Scranton and, and so many other great cities uh, there. I don't know that I've been to Erie, but we've got to definitely fix that now that um, Patrick and I are working together and, and doing some wonderful things. Um, I want to talk a little bit about my book, which I actually have the physical copy here uh, for you to see. And uh, this is really a labor of love, uh, something that I'm really just honored to have, have kind of received. And I'm, I'm just going to tell you a little bit of uh, the journey of the book. Uh, I graduated from, from Juilliard in uh, 2006. I moved to New York in 2001. Three weeks after New York, um, or being in New York, September 11th happened. So that was a complete, just brain like wash <laughs> uh, of watching the city of New York sort of uh, dissipate, but then come back together and be stronger than ever. Uh, by the time I graduated in 2006, 
I had a couple of different opportunities in college to, to drop out and kind of go on the road and be professional. And I kept having really amazing mentors saying to me, hey, Ulysses, you know, stick it out. And I'm really thankful because I had no idea any of this stuff would happen. Um, however, two things that I want to mention that happened to me while in school was one, I had a chance to take a classical music business course where pretty much, you know, the, the sum total of it was the teacher saying, hey, learn how to write a bio, you know, learn how to create a really great headshot and then uh, write a cover letter for orchestra auditions. And, you know, I remember raising my hand and saying, hey, uh, I'm, uh, you know, I definitely would love to learn how to write a bio. I've already had several bios and I definitely want to learn how to have a great headshot or a better one. Um, but I'm not applying for orchestras. And he says, all right, Ulysses, I'll get back to you shortly. And then class ended. Uh, the second class was run by a wonderful mentor of mine, Greg Knowles, who spent a lot of time talking about uh, a recording industry that even then was sort of antiquated because basically within that first year in my music business class, uh, I saw Tower Records, which was on 66th Street, literally get shattered and closed because the invention of something that we all uh, can't live without, which was called the iPod. So I literally saw music go from us buying CDs and you know, people buying LPs to within one year, we were figuring out how to download those CDs and LPs onto a computer and then create something called an MP3. And then obviously by the time I finished college, we were all using iPhones. So I, I started keeping this log of different things in my, my journal of like what I wish someone taught me. And they all kind of evolved and revolved around the ideas of music business, which is the actual business of music, you know, everything from contracts and, you know, um, records and touring and all that. And then there's music entrepreneurship, which I was seeing becoming a very new tool that musicians needed to have so that they could thrive. And then the last piece, which was career development. And I saw that the, the musicians, I feel um, within uh, the sort of terrain of trying to be successful, really needed more help on the career development and sort of music entrepreneurship side more so than the music business side because music business was changing. Uh, one quick thing, Jade or Patrick, is it possible to maybe take the sound or notifications off of people entering in? So it's, it's a little bit distracting. It'd be great if they could do that. Um, but anyway, so as a result, I, I spent many years just journaling every time I thought of something. And then I, I, I uh, or I should say, thought of something that I wanted to be taught. Then I had the fortune to, to go on the road with Kurt Elling and Christian McBride and Winter Marsalis and all these incredible artists having a chance to work with major organizations and institutions and saying, wow, like here's another series of things. And so I, I figured out, you know, after about 12 to 15 years, I was like, man, I think I need to write this book, you know, because I, I would start lecturing about it around the country and people would say, my, man, Ulysses, you gotta, you gotta write this book because we want to know this. So what you're looking at is, is a labor of love and about 15 years of hard work. So what I'm going to do today in my talk is just kind of introduce you all to a couple major subjects and talk about um, some things around the book, which is simply titled The Musician's Career Guide, Turning Your Talent into Sustained Success. I'm fortunate to have a great co-writer. I wrote the entire book, but I'd never written a book before, uh, or I should say a large scale book. So my co-writer really helped me to shape and, and, and uh, categorize things. So let's, let's dig in. And I designed this presentation specifically for all of you all in Erie. So the first thing is, you know, the book is broken up into four parts and those four parts are essentially, um, first is you are a business, the music industry, entrepreneurship and branding and art and survival. So I like to start the presentation kind of in the same way. And I love this quote from Mark Cuban, you know, many times as artists, we're always trying to figure out what is the future? What are we reaching towards? And I love this quote where he simply says, the best way to, pre to predict the future is to invent it. So the first thing I want us to understand as we veer or venture into this discussion, uh, or I should say presentation, is what is entrepreneurship? Uh, because I think that as we are in 2021 at the, fortunately, the close of a pandemic, entrepreneurship is going to be the key between those who are talented and able to create sustainable careers and those are who are talented and sort of still waiting on someone to give them an opportunity. So entrepreneurship is simply the activity of setting up a business or businesses taking on financial risk in the hope of profit. As a musician, as a professional artist, as a freelance artist, this is who we are. We are daily figuring out 
how to set up ourselves as a business. And we're taking on a greater financial risk in order to do that. Um, I also went a step further and I wanted to identify four types of entrepreneurial businesses. So we as the musicians or creative or dancers or whomever, um, we are entrepreneurs, but then there are subcategories of, of, of entrepreneurial businesses that we will fall under. One is a small business, which is a private owned you know, corporation or partnership. Um, another is a startup or scalable startup, which is a young company founded by one or more entrepreneurs to develop a unique product or service and bring it to the market. Another is a large company, big business that involves large scale corporate control, financial or business activities. And lastly, you have social entrepreneurship, which is basically an approach by individuals or groups of startups in which they develop, fund and implement solutions that help and contribute to social, cultural, environmental issues. So the ones that I would say I'm most familiar with as a musician is definitely small business. And I think there's obviously a large part of what we do as creatives that is absolutely social entrepreneurship because we as creatives and artists, what we do is for the people, is for society. So nothing that we do is separate from that. So it's great to understand first, everybody on this call, including Patrick, including Jade, including whomever, if you're in the creative sector, we are all entrepreneurs. And the sooner and quicker that we embrace that, the, the, the better we will be because then we'll be able to create kind of a path and a journey as it pertains to what our specific uh, entrepreneurial facet will be. As we keep going further on, we talked about the entrepreneurial business types. Now we're gonna talk about seven types of entrepreneurs. One is a world changer, someone keenly aware of your environment, both on a local and global scale. Second, you have, and, and you know, world changer could be someone like, you know, an Oprah Winfrey, an innovator could be someone like a Steve Jobs. You know, you're all about creating a product or a service, an opportunist. You have a gift for intuitive timing and are able to choose the right location. I think that would very easily be someone like Jeff Bezos. Uh, Jack of all trades, you're trying to do everything but not well. That could be a lot of us, right? Because I always say, for those of us that are successful, because I get a lot of emails, especially since I've written this book and people are like, hey, Ulysses, can you do coaching with me? Uh, can you help me? And most, I would say 95 to 97% of the people I talk to, chances are they have not narrowed their focus enough. It's not that what they're doing isn't good. It's not even that who they are isn't uh, appropriate for whatever they're venturing to. It's not even uh, that they aren't talented or smart. Uh, it's not even that they don't have resources or a network of people. Chances are they're trying to do too many things at the same time. And in that sort of, uh, you know, multitasking or, you know, sort of uh, doing too much to just keep it playing, uh, they are kind of sabotaging the success that they could have. Uh, number five, a typical entrepreneur is someone that focuses on one business idea, a single company, and they follow it through. That's someone like... Um, uh, what's my man, Bill Gates, you know, he started tinkering with computers uh, as he was very young and, you know, built Microsoft. And then now we look up and I mean, he's one of the richest people in the world. And but he started that that wealth from first a wealthy idea, which was the personal computer. Uh, the serial entrepreneur number six is someone who constantly produces new ideas and starts new businesses. So number four and six kind of go hand in hand when you have this sort of jack of all trades trying to do everything. And then you have this person who's just constantly producing new ideas and you're not really allowing the idea to really take hold and focus a team and, a, and, 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 and sort of a system built around it that just gives it time to grow. Uh, and then lastly, the entrepreneur, which is a person who wants to be, but never realizes or fulfills the idea and ambition. And so I want you all to know, and I, I tell people this all over the world when I get a chance to talk, is that you single-handedly, each of you on this call and each of you watching this video, you are the difference between where you are and where you desire to be. If you are single-handedly happy, then continue on that, that path. If you are not happy and you wanna figure out how to get or shift or elevate, chances are you are the reason why you aren't where you want to be. So one of the things that I like to do when I'm doing a, 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 or executing a similar, similar type of presentation is I always tell my, my audience, look at this list before I change the page and pick which one you are or which one you, des you, you desire to be. Are you that world changer? Are you that innovator? Are you an opportunist? Are you a jack of all trades? Are you a typical entrepreneur? 
Are you a serial entrepreneur or are you a entrepreneur? And, uh, you know, I heard a quote from a great drummer because I'm a drummer uh, many years ago. His name is Tony Williams. And he said that you will be 75% on your way to solving any problem once you're aware, right? And so I find that if anything, you know, if you don't remember anything that I said from this presentation, I want each of you all to realize where you are, who you are, and what you need to do or where you need to shift to so that you can get to that point of creating what I talk about in the book, which is a sustainable career. The next uh, piece is, you know, seven steps to becoming an entrepreneur, right? So we started with the four types of entrepreneurial businesses. Then we talked about, you know, the seven types of entrepreneur. So now we want to talk about, and we want to talk about uh, how to become an entrepreneur. So the first step, and this is something that I've gone through many times where uh, I've, at this point, I have probably had maybe seven or eight businesses. Um, now I'm really fortunate that I have about three that are doing really well. One is Don't Miss a Beat, which is my family's organization, which is how I met Patrick. The other is my uh, production company, uh, which I'm thankful has, is 10 years old. Uh, another is just my own business as an artist. But I've also, you know, I had a record label at one point. I've had a couple online businesses and they didn't do well. And so with step one, I want you all to realize you have to find the right business idea for you. And that idea needs to be something that can really be long-term that you can really develop and you can grow over time. And the another part of being an entrepreneur is that not every idea is gonna do well. Like I said, I have a few, I, I mean, just last year at the height of the pandemic, I launched an online business that I thought was just gonna explode and do well, and it didn't do well. It didn't even pay for my startup cost, but I learned a lot from it. And I understood now when I decide to start something else, I'm gonna take that idea through a lot more of a vetting process as a result of, I don't call it a failure, but I, I wasn't able to make the business as successful as I wanted to. So step one, I want everybody to find the right business idea, find the right business uh, for you that you can thrive at. Step two, determine if you should get an education. And I wanna clarify, education is very, uh, there's multiple ways to look at it, right? Education can be formal or informal. Right now, I think everybody should get a bachelor's degree in whatever that thing you want to specialize into uh, in, because I think bachelor's degrees are now becoming kind of just a baseline of what the business world is expecting. Uh, now it's getting to the point where a master's degree is sort of not anything special. So I think you need to figure out what is the education that you want to get. For instance, one of my friends, she's an incredible singer. Her name is Alicia Olatuja. And she has this incredible online video course where she helps singers. It's called uh, the Vocal uh, it's the uh, vocal Masterclass of Vocal Book. I, I can put it in the chat later. Vo sorry, Vocal ba Breakthrough Academy. That's what it is. I was, my wheels were spinning. But anyway, she started realizing that part of her pedagogy was not just her teaching people how to sing, but she was doing a lot of life coaching. And so she actually went back to school and got a certificate in life coaching because she said, wow, like if I really wanna shift my business to the next level and my offering and raise and elevate my value, I need to become a life coach. And she's done that. And now her course is even better than what it used to be. Um, so it's step two, you all want you, you may wanna figure out what is that education that you wanna get. For instance, when I knew that I wanted to write the book, I hired a writing, actually two writing coaches, but I started with one writing coach I literally had a blog for two years. I was writing blogs. My, I was working with my writing coach every week. I was not getting paid for this. I was paying my writing coach every week just so I could get better at writing. Then when I started working on the book, I paid uh, my co-writer so that she could help me build a business proposal. So literally I put myself kind of in an incubator for about three to four years of writing. But now I look at it. Now I have a book, not, well, actually multi-book deals. I have other books I'm working on now. So for whatever that business idea that you're going to have for yourself, then what is the educational path that you need to take yourself and, and become part of so that you can be more ready to advance that business idea and, and in a substantive way? Three, plan your business. I see a lot of people make a lot of mistakes because they don't take their idea from a thought and even the moment of education, which is all internal. Uh, they don't take it from that out to writing the business plan. I'm a spiritual guy and there's a Bible verse 
uh, in Habakkuk that talks about write the vision, make it plain, and then at the appointed time, that vision will come to pass. So I think it's really important to make sure that in our business plan, that we strategically lay it out. Sometimes like I'm a visual guy, I've got to see it because you can have, you know, in your, 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 in your, your mind, like, all right, I want to, I want to create a car wash and then I want to do this. And I want to have these three people help me. And then I want it to be here and be there. Well, let's get it on paper or at least get it on the computer or in a notes feature. And then we could sort of go from there. Number four, find your target group audience. Um, I want you to understand, and I, you know, I don't want to belabor it because I want to make sure I get to questions. This is probably one of the key entities and ingredients in building a sustainable business. I've met people that have had million to billion dollar ideas, but they were not able to find their target audience. That was the root of my failed business, the online business that I had last year. It was a great idea. I vetted it. I talked to a lot of people, but I didn't find the right audience. And as a result, the audience did not grow. So what was a great idea did not expand and sustain because I didn't find the audience. And so again, many of you that may be on the verge of really being successful, it may not be that you haven't found the right business. It may not also be that you don't have an education. It may not also be that you don't have a business plan. It might be the hindrance or the hiccup might be that you need to identify that target group audience. And that in and of itself, takes a lot of research. You know, um, when I wrote this book proposal with my co-writer, there's a whole section in book proposals where you have to identify the audience and, and so much so that you have to actually go and identify what are books that already exist that are sort of um, neighboring your topic so that the publisher can be aware and you aware of what's already in the market that caters to what you're doing, okay? So step five, you have to also network. Step six, sell your idea. Step seven, you have to also market your idea. So these are all really important things. Um, and then you have creative entrepreneurship. Uh, another piece of being an entrepreneur, which I love from Nancy Coin, uh, is turbulence is the new normal. So we, you know, part of being an entrepreneur is understanding that it's going to be a rocky role. But, but as you learn how to navigate and live in that discomfort, then you will be able to create uh, a sustainable business over time. Uh, another thing that I think is really key, and I'm going to kind of move through some of these points because I know we don't have as much time, but how do you determine if you're entrepreneurial or an entrepreneur? Uh, because you have a lot of people who are like, man, I want to run a business or I want to operate a business, but it may not necessarily be your niche to, to be an entrepreneur. It may be your niche to help someone who is an entrepreneur and work on their team. So here's some things to think about. What is your temperament? Are you risk adverse? And I'll tell you right now, if you are afraid of risk, if you're afraid of losing, starting over, this is not for you. <laughs> like, it's not for you. So if you're a person that really does not do well with risk, you should go work with a, a more established business that's gone through all of this. And then you can maybe learn how to work within the team. If you're a person that's unafraid of risk, then this could be the life for you. Another thing that's in, uh, very uh, key and uh, integral is conducting a personal SWOT analysis, and that's S-W-O-T. And I learned that uh, in business school, uh, S is for strengths, W is for weaknesses, O is for opportunities, T is for threats. So behind every business, and I admonish everybody, whatever you're gonna start, like whether it's a teaching studio or whatever, you need to create a SWOT analysis, which makes sure that you understand what are your strengths, what are the business's strengths, what are your weaknesses and the business weakness? What are the opportunities? And then what are the threats? And even just this will help you to start probably 50% further along than other people who never go through a SWOT analysis. Uh, again, three steps to come becoming an entrepreneur or stay on top of trends, explore trends and apply your strengths. So uh, I'm very big into creative entrepreneurship. Uh, which is essentially all the things we're talking about in entrepreneurship, but in the creative industry. Um, I have my five facets of, or actually more, uh, the facets of creative entrepreneurship, uh, which is, you know, what is your primary creative outlet? What is the creative industry and sector? You know, all of this stuff is really key. You can look at this on the video, and these are great things to write in your presentation, or I should say in your own journal, and answer these for yourself. Um, you know, you know, again, just kind of drilling down that idea. 
Um, another thing that's really great for you to think about, and I admonish everyone on this call to do, is write your own personal mission statement. Because again, as we go from, you know, what is an entrepreneur, what, what is the sector or type of entrepreneurial business you're going to be in, which, you know, which aspect are you going to have, you know, and then the business idea, and again, focusing and focusing and focusing, going back to what is then your personal mission statement. And, you know, I, I was watching uh, a video and doing some research a few months ago, and I sort of heard mission broken down like this, uh, which is mission is the largest thing that you want. It's the big overarching thing that you want. Vision is the quantifiable expression of that. So for me, I wanted to create an opportunity for the world to be full of more artistically minded individuals, particularly in at-risk communities. Uh, the vision is starting Don't Miss a Beat, which is uh, a, an organization, artistic organization for what I like to call, call At Hope Youth and using the arts as a bridge to a better life. So for you, you may wanna figure out what is your mission statement? What is that mission? And, and I've also heard it spoken that your mission is that thing that keeps you up at night. It's the thing that, that says, what, what is it that bothers you in life? And you begin to build a mission around that. And then the vision becomes the, the, the exercise of that or the actual fulfillment of that through an idea. Um, next thing, you know, just different, you know, entrepreneurship project necessities, you know, as you are deciding what you're going to do as an entrepreneur and your business idea, things that you're going to need are like CV, which is a curriculum vitae, bio, you're going to have to get pitch statements, you know, which is how do you pitch your idea? Uh, think, you know, a show that I love that's great to watch is Shark Tank. It's an excellent masterclass on how to pitch an idea. Uh, also, you're going to have to learn how to write grants, figure out funding sources, uh, understanding budgets and business plans, you know, which are basically about how to drill down and become more specific about different ideas. Um, fundraising, you know, I, I heard this quote many years ago, people who can raise money will be very successful. Because if you have the ability to walk in a room and raise money, that is going to allow you to bring success to whatever idea that you're going to focus on. Um, you know, as I come close to uh, kind of, you know, moving through this so I can get to some questions, because I know we're getting close to maybe having a little over 20 minutes left. Um, the art of persuasion, I find, is a very key thing. Um, having the ability to speak publicly, you know, activate an idea in a meeting and, 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 uh, and empower people, even in an email, convey an idea, communication, building a team, thinking outside of the box, commitment, resilience, all of these things tie into the ability to be persuasive and be able to get my idea across again to fulfill it and build what again I talk about, which is sustained success. Uh, I love this quote here from Mark Cuban, which says, every no gets me closer to a yes. And I will tell you for those that are desiring to be an entrepreneur or be entrepreneurial, you're gonna have to be able to walk in a room and convince people. Uh, Winter Marcellus, who's my boss and also someone I look up to, he says very often that in 2021, an artist is going to have to figure out how to walk in a room with their instrument or their talent or whatever it is that they do and figure out how to transform that room with their talent. It is, it is literally non-negotiable. So the art of persu or persuasion, excuse me, is something that is very key to the things that you want to create for yourself positively. Um, at this juncture, I'm going to shift to a couple of chapters that are in my book. Uh, again, branding and all the things that I've dealt with in entrepreneurship, all that is in the book as well. Um, these few chapters that I'm going to talk about are very specific, and I'll just bring them up because I know that I'm speaking to a lot of artists, and maybe some of this stuff will be helpful to you, and maybe you may even have some questions. So I'll kind of move through it sort of swiftly so we can get to some of the questions. Chapter 13 is really about the protection of you and yourself and your art. Um, it's important to not just focus on creating art, but how to protect it, because there's a lot of people who have created things and not protected it, and therefore someone else was able to benefit from their hard work. So I address within chapter 13 um, and protecting yourself and your art, when do you need a lawyer? Contract review, contract language, legalese. You know, uh, it's, it's, it's more than saying, hey, please make sure when you play my song that you honor within my song that you pay me a royalty. 
there's a whole legal language to put that on a contract and make sure that you are protected. Also drafting your own contracts within my chapter three, 13, excuse me, I have a great lawyer who's actually in Jacksonville, Obi Umana, who gave me a list of, for those that can't afford lawyers, cause hey man, it's a pandemic. All of us are, you know, struggling with, with money on some level because of, you know, being out of work, especially if you're creative. Um, but Obi gave me some great uh, uh, steps. I think it's about five to seven steps of how to draft your own contract. So that's really important. Also trademarking, having managers, agents, or representation to protect you. And also one thing I wanna say about protection as it pertains to your art is knowing when you really need that, right? Like if you're just starting day one, it may be better to solidify the idea, solidify your practice. And then as it becomes more solidified and concrete, then you can build a team around it to protect it. But if you're still not completely in a cohesive place with your idea, it may not be best to get a lawyer when you haven't even quantified or qualified what you're going to actually do. The next uh, chapter, which again is key, and I talked about a little bit of this when I mentioned fundraising, uh, chapter 14 is financial money management and funding an idea. Um, and you need you know, financial tips, you're going to be dealing with taxes in this chapter, compensation, documenting your compensation, career financial goals, presenting idea versus begging. And I'm going to tell you, you know, if, if someone if someone were to ask me, Ulysses, you know, what are the key things that really identify someone who's going to be successful and someone who's not? I'll break it down to three things: the ability to have a unique idea, having a great team, and I would say financial management and funding an idea. I remember when we started our organization, someone said to us, "If you can make it past five years financially, you'll be okay." And they're right, because what you go through in the first five years of running a business or an organization is so transformative <laughs> that if you can figure out how to manage your funding, also manage limited funding, because in the first five years, it's going to be very hard to get a lot of support financially. Um, if you can navigate your financial management and the funding of whatever you're going to do, then you can pretty much survive. Chapter 15, uh, I deal with keys to community engagement as an artist. Uh, which is, I'm very big about serving the community with artistry. Uh, it's also important to understand when you are dealing with the community through your artistry, the community can feel your intentions or lack thereof. I remember early on when I started in Jacksonville, I was going back and forth to New York and I, I hadn't quite committed myself to Jacksonville. And it was at a point where people could feel that I, I definitely wanted to help my kids, but I wasn't fully representing my heart and how I approach people, particularly in my communication. So once I flipped that and got better at it, the community showed up. And now we are very supported because we are able to really allow the community to feel our intentions for our work and our mission and our kids and our community. And therefore they join what we're doing. So if you're struggling, you know, with maybe getting people to jump, jump on board with you, it might be because maybe they can't feel your intentions or maybe the intentions they feel aren't necessarily positively reflecting what your business idea is. Make sure you're supporting and devoting yourself to an aspect of community work, even if you don't desire to start a nonprofit organization. I think every artist now and creative needs to figure out how to really engage in the community. Even Fortune 500 companies are figuring out community initiatives because I think we have realized that we cannot focus and grow with sort of a singular mentality of just being about yourself. And uh, I heard this many years ago as well, to really be impactful, all you have to do is care. And whatever it is that you choose to care about, if you genuinely care about it, you're gonna advance and you're gonna grow and you're gonna have a great group of people to help you grow. Um, one thing that's very important as I get close to the end of the, uh, the, the presentation and I started finding out, you know, as I did lectures and things around the world was that we have to guard our mental capacity and our mental health. You can't have a positive life and a negative mind. So you've got to make sure that mental health is important to you. In addition to the physical aspects, you know, exercising and sleeping and all that stuff, you've got to really make sure you're mentally aware and you're mentally there because what you don't overcome mentally, you'll never be able to overcome physically. Our lives are a result of what we mentally manifest. Um, oftentimes the challenges that we're having technically as a musician arrive because there's a mental block born 
from a combination of personal, personal and musical insecurities. We are all insecure beings. And I find that the minute that we acknowledge that and we lean into that insecurity, we're able to create again, ways to, to overcome it. And again, all of that bleeds into your work. It bleeds into your professionalism. Um, and you've got to overcome the, the fear and stay focused. So if you're looking at, again, why haven't you made it? Why haven't you gotten to that next level? It might be mentally, you haven't gotten yourself to a place that's stable enough to be able to say, this is what I want. And then again, move that forward. Uh, the emotional side of being a musician uh, and a creative is, is really uh, key as well. There's, there's obviously a huge overlap between the mental and emotional sides of being a musician. You got to learn how to feed your happy. Also, part of the mental side of being a musician is not only creating and reaching for and working towards your goal, but it's also about taking care of yourself, taking a break. Uh, I always like to say an empty soul creates empty music. So make sure you embrace personal relationships and the right relationships, right? Don't just say, oh my God, you're listening, you're right, I'm lonely, I need someone, and you go get someone that distracts you. Make sure those personal relationships are fortuitous and they're helpful to your process, not harmful. And lastly, uh, something that I think is really key as well, that could sort of be that fourth sort of non-negotiable reason why you're not getting where you want to get to in your life or your career is mastery. Mastery is described as having comprehensive knowledge in an area or skill. Uh, but my opinion is that mastery is an undeniable level of power and talent in an area. When someone is a master, you have the privilege of listening and observing that master and you're left in awe. And that skill is so dazzling and so profound that it renders bystanders speechless and delighted. For instance, when you watch Kobe Bryant play basketball, may he rest in peace. You watch Serena Williams. You watch some of these young ladies who recently I've seen uh, that are running track and field for the, the pre-qualifications for the Olympics. You watch Tiger Woods play golf. You watch, you know, uh, who, I mean, you watch Martha Stewart cooking. You watch, you know, who, whatever it is. I'm sure there's incredible artists in Erie that you, when you watch them, they have a level of mastery. It's just, <clears throat> it's something that takes over you and you're like, oh my God, I'm inspired. So maybe the missing link may be, you might not be good enough or masterful enough in your business. And that might be why you're not successful, right? So these are all things that we have to make sure that we really tune into as part of the process of building whatever business that we're building, we have to make sure that we have all these, these sort of boxes checked. Um, so I, I hope that you enjoyed my presentation. My goal was just to kind of give you a little bit of, a, of an appetizer into the musician's career guide, also into entrepreneurship, things to think about, and I uh, hope you enjoyed it. So I'm happy to answer uh, any questions or if there anything you want me to clarify or go back to points that I made. I know I, my pace was moving, but I know we had a limited amount of time. So thank you all very much. Ulysses, thank you. I'd like to, to start it off with a question that's been on my mind quite a bit lately. And, and I think that it's somewhat a two-part question, but it's the same, it's two different sides to the same coin. And, and calling upon your own career path and journey as, as an artist and as a uh, creative entrepreneur, what role do you feel being proactive played in your success versus reactive? And then the flip side to that, what role do you think resiliency plays in success? Man, that's great. So I just want to clarify the first one is what role does proactivity play uh, versus being reactivity in my success? Uh, and then the last part of that question again, you talked about resilience. Yeah, resiliency, you know, and, and if, if, if you're someone that those two things being proactive or being resilient doesn't necessarily come naturally, are there ways that you think that that, that uh, muscle can be strengthened? Right, those, those are great questions. So first, I would have to say absolutely, being proactive is the key to success. Um, everything from the book, every to me playing the drum since I was two years old, to you know, going to the right school, to joining a band, to, to forming my own band, to, you know, doing research on what Juilliard is. I mean, every element of my life, I can trace it back to a place of proactivity. So absolutely, I think that I have been proactive in knowing what I want. And I think what is even better than proact being proactive is knowing what is it that you desire. And I find that a lot of creatives and artists are unaware. So then they're, they don't know what to be proactive about. Right. 
So I think if you can first figure out what is it that you want, and I always say, I've never been the smartest and I've never been the most talented, but I've always been gifted with knowing what I wanted. And I'm thankful to that. So I would say to anybody, you got to know what you want. Then once you know what you want, then you, to your point, can be proactive. And then I think after the proactivity, then comes the resilience of you're going in that direction, you're moving in that direction, but sometimes it doesn't happen fast. And sometimes what you deserve, you have to be tested to see if you deserve it. And part of that testing is just staying in the game. So I'm a, I'm a big proponent for proactivity and obviously resilience. Uh, I think your other question was, what are some steps to being proactive? I would say, you know, get that idea in your head. What do you want? And then I think when you get that idea, write that idea down. That's a big step to me in being proactive is taking the idea, putting it on paper or putting it in, you know, on the computer or a tablet or whatever, your phone. And then I always say, spend, spend a little bit of time every day moving that idea forward. So first, what do I want? Two, as you establish what you want, put it on paper or digital paper. And then what are you going to do every day to move that idea forward? So for me, like the book, as an example, I spent, you know, once I got with my co-writer and she's like, all right, Ulysses, we're doing this. I spent an hour, at least an hour every day writing something. Some of the stuff I wrote was a dud and some of it is what you're reading today. So I think those are really key to that proactivity of knowing what it is, you know, identifying it. Um, a great book that I really suggest everybody should read it's called Write It Down, Make It Happen. It's written by Henrietta Clouser. And it's really about the power in writing and the law of attraction coupled with writing and how that helps manifesting. So I think those things help with the proactivity. And then I think the resilience is just believing in yourself and having faith in yourself and not giving up. The next question I wanna ask uh, relates back to one of the things that you identified as one of the top three kind of factors in determining success, which is the team you work with. And, and I'm wondering, you know, what recommendations do you have for individuals that are trying to build a team? Great. So the first thing I would say, if you want to build a team, I want you all to take, uh, if you can go back to that SWOT analysis, uh, which is your strengths or weaknesses, your opportunities and your threats. I want everybody to do a SWOT analysis for yourself. Okay. So I can tell you right now, my strength, is my proactivity. I'll stay up all night. I'll outwork a lot. Most people, like I'm very strong in that way, but sometimes in my, my energy and my drive, I can sometimes not be a stickler for the real sort of micro details. So Patrick met Felicia. Uh, I have Felicia Bass, who's my sister, but also my director of operations. She helps deal with those details. So I, the first thing I would say is when you know your strengths and then your weaknesses, build a team of people. So Felicia is a person that looks at my contracts. She makes sure all my agreements are right because I've got so many things that I'm doing that I don't always have the time to be very micro or be very microscopic. So I would say, as you build your team, build it around your weakness first. So if my strength, if my weakness is the microscopic, get someone that's very detail oriented, maybe your microscopic person that's very, you know, you're, you're like zoned in. So then you may need to get a big picture person, someone that says, hey, let's zoom out and let's, let's, you know, hey, let's consider this. So I think as you build your team, you can only build around your strengths and your weaknesses. So I think if you're not fortunate to have a good team, it's probably because you haven't analyzed yourself fully. The last piece to building a team, use people, or excuse me, utilize people who have experience, Okay. I'm also a big proponent. I don't like hiring my friends. So I hire my friends as it pertains to maybe giving them opportunities. But sometimes in your inner circle, your friends may be afraid to, to, to challenge you, you know? So I would say that last piece of hiring the right team is really making sure that you choose someone who has experience. For instance, if you hire an accountant and it's your home girl or homeboy who you went to school with, but they've never actually had an accounting client, will they be the best for you? You know, so I think those two things of knowing what you knowing what you're great at and not so great at and building that and then someone that has experience. The last question I have uh, immediately and we'll see if Antonio or Esther or Jade have any additional questions. I'll also look on Facebook to see if any comments or questions have been typed in there is you've talked a lot about knowing what you want. 
And I think one of the things that sometimes happens is that opportunities arise that might not necessarily fully relate to what we've defined as wanting, but we can convince ourselves why we should say yes to those, even if it's not a, a, a direct alignment. And I'm wondering, you know, what you have to share about the power of saying no to actually move you closer to the yes that matters. And also, um, if you have any internal processes that you employ around how to say yes or no to an opportunity. Man, I mean, that you answered the question, Patrick. I mean, that, you know, I read a book many years ago and it said simply, there's a quote that said, really successful people say no more than they say yes. So one of the things that I did a few years ago, I felt myself getting really overwhelmed and I felt myself not giving my best. Like I'm sure people on the call, like you've gotten to a point where you're like, I'm not, I'm my, my output is not excellence. So I had to really, I had to really look at what was happening and what I surmised was that I had not activated my no. I was saying yes to too many things and my yes didn't mean as much anymore and it wasn't as valuable. So one of the things that I had to do was I started activating my no by like doing simple things in my life. So I'll be completely transparent. One of the things that I started doing was I changed my diet. I said, if I can't say no, I, right now I'm a pesky vegan, what I call myself. So I eat pescatarian diet and, and vegetables. So I was like, if I can't say no to a piece of steak or a piece of pork or whatever that I say I'm, I'm prohibiting myself from, then how can I say no to somebody who wants to give me an opportunity that isn't good for me? So I started activating my no in these small ways in my life, even simple things like I'm not going to eat past 10 o'clock. I'm going to work out once a day, even if it's a 10 minute workout. Uh, I'm going to, you know, get eight hours of sleep. So I started activating these small ways of really saying no and being and convincing myself that I could trust my own word. So that was something that I think uh, first was really key, um, um, key to that. And I think key to really me getting to that level of knowing like, wow, Ulysses, like you, you can definitely believe and trust yourself. And then that carries out like further of trusting the other yes. Um, the other thing is that you can't say yes to, many, to too many things and be great at them. I'm sorry, like it's just impossible. Um, and so I think what I've started doing as I've gotten older is what, like, I really, 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 really want to be good at what I do. Like this presentation you booked me for over a month ago, I had it ready two weeks ago. I planned ahead. Like, so I find that when you say yes to less stuff, what you say yes to, you can be really, really good at and dynamic at, and you can also be impactful at versus someone saying, oh, I'm going to say yes to all these different things. And then you don't do them as well. So I think um, those are some ways that I've learned um, how to say no um, and, and sort of games I've played with myself. Um, and then I think also acknowledging my humanity. My, my therapist told me many years ago, Ulysses, acknowledge your humanity and acknowledge that you are fragile and volatile, which means that if you overcommit yourself, you're going to, like, you're going to fold. <laughs> and so when she told me that, it was so great because I actually was able to show up like as a real person in my relationships and my business, you know, occurrences and opportunities, because I acknowledge like, okay, dude, in about an hour, you're going to get tired. Okay. In about two hours, you're going to get hungry. So then I started building these boundaries around my actual humanity, as opposed to what I was doing before was trying to be this superhuman and then just folding in front of everybody. So I think a big part of saying yes and no is acknowledging your humanity and part of being a human being is that we get tired, we get sleepy, we, we get hungry, we get angry. And if we can start building boundaries around those realities of, of our humanity, then we can sort of be proactive and, and get ahead of things as opposed to, to your point, being reactive. Um, I wanna make sure I answered every part of that question. Did I, Patrick? Yeah, I think you were, uh, I think you knocked it out of the park and went okay. above. <laughs> okay. I also know that Antonio on the call this evening uh, recently adopted a plant-based diet uh, wow. and been having good successes in that and has also been learning the power of saying no. Uh, I've also been vegan for 15 years, so we're talking to some vegetable plant-based uh, lovers over here. Yeah, and, you know, man, it was deep. And too, like, Pat, I have to, to take that a step further. When I started saying no to those things, like the, the, the food, it was so easy to say no to the other stuff. You know what I mean? Like versus when I was 
like not happy with myself. I was eating, like I woke up one day and I was like, damn, like I'm drinking too much. I'm eating too much. I'm like, that's how I was looking is how I was feeling. Then when I started to cut those other things out, then it was also not as, it was harder for people to get a yes from me because, because again, everything starts with your own relationship that you have with everything in your life. So, and, and, I, and I want people to understand that too. Everything you do is an extension of who you are internally, <laughs> you know? So whatever you see someone, like if somebody's thriving and like, oh my God, every time I talk to them, they're so positive. Well, that's probably because if you like, if you like peeked into their life, like, like in their house when nobody was watching, there's something they're doing that's really positive in their life. So what, what you're experiencing is just a reflection of whatever that internal relationship they already have. You know, versus I think sometimes people are like, they're trying to radiate something that's very different from what they don't have internally, you know? Yeah, what I often ask artists is how do they refill their well, right? You can't just continue to do withdrawal, withdrawal, withdrawal without also making deposits. And I think that when folks get to that point of depletion, not only do their personal relations suffer, but their work also suffers. So, you know, one of the questions I always ask is what are you doing to refill the well? Antonio, Esther, or Jade, uh, do you have any questions this evening for Ulysses? If so, feel free to unmute or unmute yourself. Well, Ulysses, thank you. Um, sincerely, um, I intend to purchase your book. You answered a bunch of questions that I had already as you were talking and as Patrick was asking questions. But one of the things um, friends of mine and myself used to discuss about the music industry and trying to build your brand was that everyone who got screwed over in the music industry would always give the advice before you get into it, you need to study up on it but nobody would ever give you a list of fucking books that you needed to refer to study up on, right? Um, and, you know, personally, I used to scour the catalogs for books on music and what exactly it was that they were talking about. Do you have a list that people can refer to to study up on that kind of thing or? Absolutely, absolutely. So obviously start with mine. Uh, but in, in addition to mine, I would say there's a great book that has many different it's called All You Need to Know About the Music Business. Um, there's another one. Um, I, I think I, I have them at my house. I can actually get uh, Patrick, if you can remind me. Uh, one is an author. Actually, I'll just look it up right here. Um, one is from the author Ari Herstan. Uh, yeah, here it is here. Uh, his book is. His book is called uh, How to Make It in the New Music Business. Uh, his is good. Uh, there's another one. Um, music business book. Starbucks. There's a guy. Uh, I, can, I, can, I have the book as well. Uh, yeah, so all you need to know about the music business, which is Donald Passman. He is, he is very key. Uh, then there's another one. What's this one about? That's not it. Um, I'll probably have to send some to, to Patrick. Um, let's see here. Yeah, you can you can totally email them to me yeah. and then we'll uh, post them. When we do the recap of this session in our blog, we'll also post the link of your recommendation. Here's a couple, here's a couple other ones. Another one's called The Song Machine by John Seabrook. Um, there's another one. I haven't read this one, but it's the Music Business Advice book. Oh, this is a good one. Um, it's, uh, this is an old one. It's called Hitmen by F uh, F Friedrich Dannen. Um, there's also another one, uh, The Plain Simple Guide to Music Publishing. Um, yeah, th those are a few that I can really like speak to. Pretty much, I would say like, even when I was in school, the Donald Passman book was really key. That, that was like the one, but again, it was very much based on uh, at a record industry that no longer really existed. Um, but yeah, I know, I know Ari's book has definitely been highly recommended. And then there's another one, um, Angelica, uh, I think it's Beaker. She has one, she's, um, 
she's a career development person um, and she's written a book. I have to get that to, to you guys. But anyway, and also if you go on Amazon where Patrick talked about my book, I think where there's these categories like music business, uh, music entrepreneurship. If you just click those categories, there are books that are coming out every month that in addition to mine that I didn't even realize that speak to this subject. So there's more stuff out there than you, than you realize, um, Antonio. So I hope those help. Yeah, very good start. Thank you. I appreciate that. Man. Ulysses asking about kind of what's next for you. Is there any interest in taking what you've established in your book and turning it into a podcast where you're actually interviewing individuals who are either emerging mid-career or established in the music industry and, and having conversations about how it relates to the points in your chapters? So, you know, it's interesting, um, Patrick, I, I actually have a pot, well, I have a YouTube series called From the Drummer's Perspective. Uh, it happens every Wednesday at 5 p.m. It's through a company called Open Studio Network. And I speak to drummers about their journey and all that. And anybody can tune in. It's really cool. I've, I've, I've already been in week three, which is tomorrow, which uh, features a wonderful drummer, Ari Honig. And uh, it's great. And it's an hour and, and, it, and I kind of talk to these drummers about various things. But to your point, I, I want to start a podcast. Uh, I really do. And I've been, I've been having a lot of people approach me. I think, again, I need the right team member. You know, I need somebody that says, hey, Ulysses, I'm going to own it. You host it. You know, they do a lot of the navigating of getting, you know, people on there. Because I just don't want to, again, what we talked about earlier, I don't want to stretch myself. Um, in addition to the podcast, I really want to create, uh, my dream is to create a consultant company, actually, uh, that can launch, you know, whether it's some events where we can come together and, and do these coachings. Because like, I remember doing a, an event about three years ago for Chamber Music America, where I sort of taught what was the very beginning of the book. And then after that, I spent all day coaching. I think I did 30 minute coaching sessions with like 10 people where I sat down with them specifically. So like I would sit down specifically with Antonio or Jade or Esther or whomever, and we would target what their actual issues were and help them. So that's something I wanna do, but again, I gotta have the right uh, support team and the right funding to be able to do that. But that would be my long-term goal is to turn the musician's career guide into a consulting agency that could really guide artists and creatives and then connect them not just with me, but with other people uh, like a roster of people that can help them get to where they want to get to and even eventually be able to help them get things funded. So that that's where I want to get to long term. Uh, but, you know, we're starting with the book today. <laughs> so. Well, I certainly look forward to seeing how that dream is uh, manifested, Ulysses, and I, and I suspect heavily that if we check back in with you in another five years, uh, you'll be well on your way towards that goal if you haven't already accomplished it. Thank you. Uh, we're, we're after seven o'clock now, so I, I want to be respectful of your time and, and wrap things up this evening. I do want to say that uh, one of our Facebook viewers, Ellie, did share a hand clap emoji. I think she uh, appreciated the words that you shared and the insights that you shared this evening. Uh, again, Ulysses, I want to thank you so much for your time and sharing your knowledge with us. We'll be doing a recap post on uh, Erie Arts and Culture's blog. I'll be sure to share a link to the from the drummer's perspective, as well as some of the books that you just suggested to Antonio. Um, but again, thank you so much uh, for your time and, and expertise this evening. Thank you. And Patrick, I just want to mention to those that want to reach out to me, I'm very accessible in that uh, you can go to my website, themusiciansCareerGuide.com. Um, there's a comment thing on there or my website, UlyssesOwensJr.com. And feel free, like if people have questions, I do answer questions. You know, like if, if I've had people hit me up uh, either through either site and if they have some questions, I will definitely answer what I can. But I, I'm not saying this because I'm trying to get you to buy the book, but a lot of what people are asking, even what Antonio asked, those answers are in the book. I mean, I literally exhausted myself asking people what, what have they never been able to talk about and it's in there. So, but, but feel free to shoot me an email or, or send me a DM on, on uh, you know, Instagram or Facebook or whatever. I'm happy to have any kind of dialogue with people. So. What, what's your uh, Instagram handle, Ulysses? It's Ulysses Owens Jr. underscore. All righty. Well, uh, again, I want to thank you and, and thank everybody who joined us this evening. And as a reminder, uh, the Pro Network is uh, funded 
partially by the National Endowments for the Arts through their Artworks grant. Uh, next week, we will have a live in-person session with uh, limited capacity focused on intro to using aerosol for visual artists. Uh, then our next virtual session is with Ebony Payne English, also out of Jacksonville, and she will be uh, talking about how to monetize your words through self-publishing. Um, if you have any questions or want to learn more about the work of Erie Arts and Culture and our pro network, please visit erieartsandculture.org. Ulysses, Antonio, Esther, Jade, and everybody else watching either on Facebook or YouTube, uh, I thank you and have a great evening. Thank you all. Thanks, Patrick. Take care.